Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. I'm very happy to come to you today because we begin a brand new book of the Bible, and it's the Gospel of Mark, which is really my favorite book probably in the entire New Testament. I love the Gospels, and the Gospel of Mark is my favorite. It was written to the Roman, and Romans were people of action. And so that's why when Mark wrote this with the help of the Apostle Peter, which was a pretty good fit because that's the kind of guy he was too. You know, Peter was a man of action. He wrote this for the Roman reader, which is why it, he didn't mess around with genealogies. He didn't mess around with the birth of Jesus Christ. He'd just get right into the meat of the life of Christ as we will see today. Mark chapter 1 verse 1 is where we will begin in just a minute. So get your Bible. While you're doing that, I'll remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com, that you can study the Bible in its entirety from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages at your pace, at your convenience, study the Word of God at the Bible verse by verse. Com. Father, today we ask your blessings on today's message and on our entire study through the Gospel of Mark. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. It says in chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Gospel means good news. This is the beginning of the good news of concerning Jesus Christ, who Mark refers to as the Son of God. Now, right off the bat, I told you this was in a, a, a gospel of action, and right off the bat, Mark tells us who Jesus is. He doesn't mess around. He is called the Son of God. And by the way, in that culture, if you were called the son of someone or something, you were being equated with that someone or something. And so Jesus, by being called the son of God in the very first book or very first verse of this book, is being equated with God. And there's only one who can be equated with God, and that's God. Jesus is the eternal son of the eternal Father. Jesus existed forever in the past along with the Holy Spirit and God the Father. But on the day that he was conceived in Mary's womb, he gave up his omnipresence and confined himself, first of all, to a tiny little embryo, to a little fetus, to a child, to a young man, to a, to a grown man. He has confined himself to a human body so that he could die on the cross and pay for our sins. Jesus is the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man. Jesus is 100% God. Jesus was 100% man. You say, well, Moret, right off the bat, you're wrong because no one can be 200% of anything. Well, Jesus can be, and he is, and that's what the Bible teaches it is in theology referred to as the hypostatic union. The fact that Jesus can be 100% fully man and 100% fully God at the same time. So right off the bat, Mark proclaims the fact that Jesus is God. He, next, he spends the next 16 chapters proving it from his life. Verse 2, as it is written, and the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. Now, as it is written in the prophets, God, in the Old Testament, told the world through the word of God that he was sending his son and that he would send someone before his son arrived on the scene and that someone would prepare the way for him and that someone is none other than John the Baptist. And so it says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. 
make his path straight. And you know, if you were a first century reader, you would know exactly what this is talking about. Because in those days, whenever a king was preparing to visit one of his cities, he would send out a road crew to make sure that the roads were smooth so that the path to the city where he was headed would be nice and smooth. And John the Baptist was sort of a spiritual road crew for Jesus. John's ministry prepared the people for the coming of the Messiah, and he prepared people by preaching repentance. Look at verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. The, the, the key thing here is repentance. The baptism was an outward sign of a person's willingness to repent or decision to repent. And so it says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. We can't gloss over this. There is no receiving Christ apart from repentance. There is no forgiveness apart from repentance. It is impossible. Mark this down. It is absolutely impossible to receive Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that comes along with him unless you are willing to turn away from your sin. You can't have it both ways. You can't make sin the Lord of your life and think that you can make Jesus your Lord and Savior. It just doesn't work that way. You can't receive Jesus Christ. You can't receive the forgiveness that comes along with that unless you at the same time are turning away from your sin. Sin and Jesus are on opposite sides of the spectrum. Sin and Jesus are on opposite, they're polar opposites completely. They are as opposite as left and right. They are as opposite as east and south. Consequently, in order to turn to Christ, you have to, at the same time, turn away from your sin, or you're not really turning to Christ with sincerity. And God demands sincerity. If you want to be a Christian and you want to be saved, as the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 12 says, to as many as receive Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. If you want to receive Jesus, if you want to turn to Christ, then you have to turn away from sin because they're on opposite sides of the spectrum, as I said. And so in order to be sincere, you're turning away from sin. Do you see that? And you're turning to Jesus at the same time. Think of it this way. Salvation is a two-sided coin. One side is repentance. The other side is asking Christ to save you. You do those two things, you're saved. That's all it takes. Verse 5. And there went out unto him, John the Baptist, all the land of Judea. And in case you don't know, Judea was the southern portion of Israel. Israel was divided into three parts. Galilee in the north, Samaria in the middle, and Judea in the, in the south. Judea is where Jerusalem was. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. They publicly confessed their sins. They were admitting in front of everyone that they were sinners. And by their submission to this water baptism, they were making a statement 
that not only were they confessing their sins, but they were repenting of their sins. And when you talk about a formula for spiritual success, you're talking about what we're seeing right here. First you have John the Baptist, a preacher of righteousness, a man of God who went back down for anyone or anything. First John the Baptist, that's number one. You have a man who's proclaiming the word of God and therefore he's not afraid to call sin, sin. He's not afraid to call hell hot. He wasn't afraid to tell the people that they needed to repent. In other words, John the Baptist spoke the pure word of God. If you're going to have salvation, if you're going to see spiritual fruit, then there has to be a man of God who will proclaim the word of God without fear, with boldness, and as clearly as God gave it. With no thought of his own comfort, with no thought of his own popularity. And that was John the Baptist. That's number one. And then secondly, you had a bunch of people here who were hungry for truth. And when those two things come together, a preacher of righteousness, a preacher of the truth, and people who are hungry for truth, you're going to have spiritual fruit. Good things are going to happen. When the truth is given to people who are hungry for truth, there are going to be good results. Like here, we see it. Many people, it says, many people were repenting, many people were confessing their sins, and many people were being baptized. They were getting ready for the arrival of Jesus with their repentance. Verse 6, And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt about his waist. And he did eat locusts and wild honey. You think you could dangle anything in front of this guy's nose and get him to water down the Word of God? You think you could dangle some bait in front of John the Baptist and get him to take it and compromise truth and compromise holiness? If you do, take another good look at what this guy lived like. He ate wild honey, he ate locusts, and he dressed in camel's hair, which is really rough. He didn't care about the world. He cared about one thing, that's God. And in order to effectively preach truth, a person has to live the truth. And what is John preaching? He's preaching repentance. He's preaching turn away from the sinful things of this world and from worldliness, because that's what repentance is, and submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, putting Jesus above the things of the world. And so in order to effectively preach repentance or self-denial, which is what repentance is, one must not be sinfully attached to the, sin, to the, to the things of this world themselves or you have no credibility, you have no power, you have no anointing in your preaching. If you're a worldly Christian, the reason that so many preachers preach lukewarm messages is because they're lukewarm. The reason they don't preach against sin is because they tolerate sin. The reason they don't, press, they don't preach pressing on with Jesus to maturity and self-denial is because they know nothing of it themselves. John ate locusts, and he lived in the wilderness, and he wore camel, camel's hair. Um, that is not exactly, exact, exactly luxury living. In fact, that was even extreme for his day. The guy had credibility when he preached self-denial because he lived what he preached. If people can't see what you and I believe by how we act, then our words are empty. They mean nothing. Nothing. I remember I wasn't saved, but I was headed in that direction. 
and I was listening to some wrong preaching. Preachers who would say, all you have to do is accept Christ. Just pray this prayer. Accept Christ. They never mention repentance. They never mention turning away from sin. Just accept Christ. Pray to receive Christ and you're saved. So I did. I didn't change. I didn't change my behavior. I didn't change my attitude. Nothing. I just added Jesus, supposedly, to everything else in my life. And I'll never forget my best friend from high school. Um, he was going to school in a different city. And he came up here, and we went out to a bar. And, um, and we were sitting around drinking beer like we always did for years, shot poo like we always did for years, um, did the things in that bar that we always did. And, and um, I told him I was a Christian, and I could still see the look on his face. He just grinned at me. He said, you are. Like, what are you talking about? And he kind of shook his head in derision. I, my words didn't mean anything to him because I wasn't living it. But then, whatever it was, six months later, I really got saved. And I, I, I repented of my sin. I turned away from my sin completely. I know I did. I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life, and I was changed before I got up off my knees. And I was changed. And I haven't been the same in the last 38 years. And once again, he came up from school and we got together and he said, and I told him I was a Christian. He said, well, come on, Rhett, let's go do this. Let's go do that. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm, not, I'm a Christian. Hmm. He still didn't become a Christian, but he took me seriously. A few months after that, he came back home again. He called me up on the phone. He said, Marat, what you doing? So you want to go out? Drink some beer, go to the bar? I said, no, I'm a Christian. He said, can I come over? Yeah, sure, come over. So he came over. And he tested me again. I said, no, Pete, I don't, oops, I gave his name. I don't, I don't do that anymore. I'm a Christian. And after I said that, he said, hey, Marat, I don't remember how long ago it was. But he said, I asked Jesus to save me, and I'm changed too. But he was testing me. But he never would have gotten saved, at least not through me, if I had not truly been saved and lived the life and not just speak the words. And that was John the Baptist. He didn't just proclaim holiness. He didn't just preach truth. He lived it. And that's what gives your words extra authority in the presence of those who know you best. A changed life will be used by the Holy Spirit to bring conviction on people that you give the Word of God to. But if you live like the devil and you tell people about Jesus, they're going to brush you aside, and they should. It means absolutely nothing. Verse 6, And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt about his waist, and he did eat locust and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. You know who he's referring to here? He's, he's referring to, when he talks about someone who stoops down and unlatches a person's shoes or sandals and washes their feet, by the way, he is referring to the lowest of the low household slaves because the lowest of all household slaves had that job. I mean, you had to be way down on the bottom. You were expected to wash your master's dirty, dusty, filthy feet when he came in from outside. And John the Baptist said, Jesus, the Messiah? 
washing his feet? That's too good of a job for me. I'm not worthy to do. I'm not worthy to be his lowest slave. I'm not worthy to be even the lowest slave to Jesus the Messiah. That's what John is saying. And it was that attitude that made John the Baptist great in the eyes of God. It was that attitude that made him so useful to Almighty God. He was great because he knew he was nothing. He was great because he humbled himself before the Lord Jesus Christ. He was great because he did not think he was great. He did not act like he was great. He was great because he would have done anything for Jesus, and yet he didn't feel like he was worthy to do anything for Jesus. He would simply obey his Lord like the lowest of all low slaves. Verse 8, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Don't tell John that he was anything special because he's not buying it. He's a servant. He's just a servant who only baptizes with water, which is nice. That was his job. But compared to Jesus, nothing. Because he says, I baptize you with water, but the one who's coming, referring to Jesus, baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. John baptized with water. That's nice. That was his job. But Jesus gives people who receive him the Holy Spirit. Now that's big. And it's big. It's huge. Because the Holy Spirit, when you repent and you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ sends the Holy Spirit into your soul, into your spirit. And the Holy Spirit, according to the Word of God, is God's seal of ownership on you. It is his brand on you. And the Holy Spirit is also the spiritual power pack in Christians that enable us to live right. Apart from the Holy Spirit, we cannot do anything to please God. Apart from the Holy Spirit, we could not live holy lives. We could not obey God. The Holy Spirit is our power pack. He is our battery. A man without the Holy Spirit is like a toy without a battery. A man without the Holy Spirit is like a gun without a bullet. He's spiritually dead. He's unable to serve the Lord. Verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Remember back in verse 5? We just looked at it a few minutes ago when it said that the people who John baptized were confessing their sins? Well, Jesus was baptized too, but did you notice the difference here? It doesn't say that he confessed any sins. He didn't confess any sins because he never committed a sin. He was the sinless son of God. He was born without original sin. He was born untainted from sin, and then he lived a sinless life, which made it possible for him to be our righteous, holy substitute, our sin offering without spot or blemish, he offered himself on the cross to pay for man's sin. He is our sinless substitute, the righteous for the unrighteous. So, he was baptized, not because he needed to repent like the rest of us. He was baptized to show support for John's ministry. He was baptized because it was the right thing for a righteous person to do. Verse 10, 
And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. This dove descending on Jesus was a prearranged sign between God the Father and John the Baptist. Now, John, he baptized probably thousands of people. But God the Father made it known to him. He said, John, you're going to baptize thousands of people. But one of those men that you baptize, a holy, the Holy Spirit is going to fall on him. He's going to land on, he's going to descend on him in the form of a dove, and he's going to remain on him. That's my sign to you. That's the guy that you are to proclaim is the Messiah. That's the one that you are a forerunner of. So start pointing people to him. And that's what happened. John baptized him, and sure enough, a dove descended from the sky, landed on Jesus, and stayed on him. That's the Messiah. But that's not all that happened. Look at verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Father speaks out loud from up in the sky, from heaven. And he tells the Son, in the hearing of everyone there, he says, with you I am well pleased. Which means that everything Jesus did was right. Which means everything that Jesus did, everything that he said was right. He never did anything wrong. He never said anything wrong. If he would have, even one time, God the Father never would have said, with you I am well pleased. God is not well pleased with you or me or anyone else. He's not well pleased with anyone except his son because Jesus is the only one who has done everything right all the time, never sinned, not once. God does not hold our sins against us if we are Christians. And yet he would never say to any of us, Way to go. You did everything right. I am well pleased with you. He would never say that to us. See, that's one huge difference between Jesus and us. Jesus is perfect. No one else is perfect. The good news for us is that when we are saved, the Bible says we are placed by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And our life is hidden in Christ. So when God looks at you after you become a Christian, even though you're not perfect in your actions, what he sees is you in Christ. What he sees is you clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So in standing, God is well pleased with you because you're in Christ, his son, who he is well pleased with. You are covered with the righteousness of Christ. That's what salvation is. When you receive Christ, you receive his righteousness accredited to your account. Your life is hidden with God in Christ. And God no longer sees your sin. That's why after you die, you're going to be welcomed into heaven. Because in position, you are accepted, the Bible says, in the Beloved in God's Son. Out of time, you can continue studying the Word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com. Remember, go there, study any book of the Bible, any chapter, by clicking and listening. Just bring your open Bible. That's all you have to do. And remember also that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. Never been underwritten by a large church or denomination. Just depend solely on individuals who love God's Word. If you want to stand with this ministry, pray for us, please. And also, Click on the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Support this ministry. Stand shoulder to shoulder with me as we get the Word of God out from Genesis to Revelation. You'll be glad you did. It's the most important thing in the world.
the Word of God. Till next time, Michael Murray for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.